<laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to Learning Space. Uh, this is uh, the, the show uh, from CosmoQuest. We are back after a brief hiatus. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the uh, pre-recorded videos uh, we had coming up every Wednesday for the last few weeks of um, some fun science activities that I did uh, mostly through Glass through Google Glass, so uh, those are all up on our YouTube page, uh, it's Astrosphere Vids on YouTube. Um, Learning Space is a weekly show about all things astronomy and space education and outreach, uh, any kind of interesting topics that we find along those lines. Uh, so we are back with a weekly live show. And uh, this week, let's see, hang on, oh, first I want to tell you guys, remind you guys on how to comment. I have needed a reminder on all of this since I've been away from it for a while. Uh, if you leave a comment on the event page on Google+, uh, where uh, this is currently embedded, we will see those comments. If you leave a comment on the YouTube page where this is playing, we will see those as well. I uh, don't have um, access to the Twitter comments anymore through Comment Tracker, but I do have a separate window up. So if you use the hashtag learning space, I will see those as well. So feel free to, to comment, say hi, and ask questions as we go through the show. Uh, so this week, I am joined by Miller Goss. Hello. <laughs> and uh, Miller Goss is a radio astronomer at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in New Mexico. Uh, and he has a book that just came out today. I got my copy a couple days early from Amazon uh, called Making Waves. So this is a book about Ruby Payne Scott, who is the first female radio astronomer. And, and anyone who has seen me on any of these hangouts knows how I go on and on about how much I love doing radio astronomy. Um, and so I, I absolutely had to have, uh, have Miller Goss on to talk about this, this really cool subject and this really cool person and um, the whole process of, of learning about her life. So, uh, Miller, why don't you start with just telling us a little bit about your background uh, as an astronomer and then how you got to find out about Ruby Payne Scott. Thank you, Nicole. It's just fantastic <clears throat> that you've organized this. It's so much fun for me, and you know my passion for Ruby. Mm -hmm. But let me give a little bit of my background. Uh, this is a monumental year for me because... Uh, um, you're, you'll not be surprised that I graduated from Harvard College 50 years ago this year. Oh, wow. Congrats. <laughs> Happy graduation anniversary. <laughs> uh, and I had a degree in astronomy, and I started a uh, PhD uh, immediately 50 years ago at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, and in those years, uh, one went very quickly through a PhD, and four years later, I was ready. And my wife and I, uh, Libby, uh, had had a, a goal, a dream of going to Australia uh, for many different reasons. One, of course, was that Australia was very famous as a, as a uh, country where radio astronomy excelled. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, some of your participants may know that after World War II, that the two countries where radio astronomy grew very fast was both Australia and Britain. So we ended up in Australia, and I went for two years, ended up staying for about six or seven. Uh, wow. uh, fell in love with the southern sky. I used the Parkes Radio Telescope, as some of you may know from the uh, very interesting and, uh, and uh, not very truthful movie called uh, 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 The Dish. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, when I was in Australia those years, my boss was a man called John Bolton. And, I, and he was very, very famous, very renowned. He, in fact, he had started radio astronomy at Caltech in the 1950s. And to come back as uh, he's, he was Australian or British and Australian and started radio astronomy, he told me one day as I was sitting in his office at the Parkes Radio Telescope, you should have been here 30 years ago. The most outstanding physicist of the lab was Ruby Payne Scott. And he said, no, I'm going to correct that. She was one of the most outstanding physicists in Australia at the time. Wow. And this was probably 1976, 77. And many years later, in the 1990s, in fact, I remembered this. And I started thinking about it. And I thought, there's something. There must be a great story here. I should try to find out what's going on. And I started researching, found out a lot about her. I met her family. And in the 1990s, many of the 
radio astronomers that had been her colleagues in Australia in the 1940s and 50s were still alive, and I learned a lot about them. And this became an, an incredible passion for me, and, and, and you were a victim of that passion. Nicole. <laughs> you were a summer student here right. in 2004 yep. and 2005, and you heard me talk about this a great deal. I was already working on the book, mm -hmm. and in fact, by 2009, the first book came out. The first book was called uh, Under the Radar. It was for a professional audience, and the new book, uh, that you showed to your participants a few minutes ago it was a popular version that was published last week oh, in God. Germany by Springer. <laughs> so that's a long version of what, how I got into this. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And so you, you know, her story wasn't well known. We hear about, you know, Carl Jansky and we hear about Gert Reber and uh, we hear about, you know, all these early pioneers in radio astronomy, and yet her name wasn't well known. And in fact, you know, some, however many years ago that was, when you did a Google search for her name, you found almost no information, uh, if any. So this, she was not a, a well-known topic. But what did she um, work on or, or in her early career? Well, her early career, she was, we think, was the third woman in Australia to ever get a physics degree. This was in the mid-1930s. Wow. And in the mid-1930s, of course, it was very difficult for anybody with a physics degree to get a job, especially a woman, mm -hmm. because it was in the middle of the Depression in Australia, and the only real pr profession open for a woman in 1936 and 37 in Australia that had a science degree was to become a school teacher, a high school teacher, which she did. Mm -hmm. uh, World War II came along, and the Australians, of course, jo joined World War II in 1939 two years before the uh, the Americans did because the uh, the Australians declared war against Germany uh, following the British Commonwealth uh, and this changed the career of many women in Australia of course as they joined the armed forces and the handful of women that had physics degrees were all snapped up immediately and they started working on radar. Okay. It turned out that she was a whiz at working on radar. She liked electronics she was good at mathematics, and she became a very important uh, participant. And you can see it was so important because the, the men who were electrical engineers and physicists were sometimes, of course, being drafted in Australia and sent to, uh, to fight in the war in New Guinea and, and places like that. So she had this background working on radar. At the end of the war, they wondered what they were going to do. And they'd heard about radio astronomy. They had read Carl Jansky's papers, and they heard about Groot Reaver for the first time. And they thought, gee, we better uh, think of something new to do that's not related to wartime research. Uh, and they started observing the sun. And she made incredible breakthroughs starting in 1945 and 46 in uh, detecting radio emission from the sun using radar receivers that the Australian Army and Air Force had left behind. Yeah, there were um, some of that was highlighted for her. What would have been her hundredth birthday? Uh, the Australia Australian Google Doodle for for her birthday. I can't remember when this was. Was this sometime last year? Yes. Um, here it oh, is. you have it. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> it, it was her. It was, it was uh, the last 28th, year. May of last year. May twenty eighth last year, and this was a fantastic publicity stunt for me. I had nothing to do with it, of course. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I started getting emails from friends in Australia, and there's an eight-hour time change, and they were all were sending these emails saying, you've got to look at this. And this actually shows uh, on the image, and it's in the new book, uh, this image, and yeah. it shows the fact, there it is, uh, you can see uh, she's radar, she's got earphones, in fact, they did yeah. use earphones, yeah. but you can see the sun, and you see the on the right of the image, you see there's something called a PPI, Planned Position Indicator that she was one of the leading experts in the world, and you all recognize that from movies and everything, is the way that uh, radar reception is still done. Uh, so she understood electronics, uh, and then she discovered all these amazing things on the sun uh, in 1946. And there was a piece of good luck here, Nicole, that it's, it's always worth report, pointing out, that it was a good piece of luck is that one of the most active sunspot maximum of the modern era began in 1946. That's a coincidence. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the exact opposite of what's happening now, right? We're in a pretty low maximum. Yeah, so yeah, I was looking at some of the pictures. Maximum, and hence, it was a great time to be a solar radio astronomer. 
Yeah, so the, she was the, so she was responsible for um, characterizing the, in, in the Google Doodle. They specifically have the Type One and Type Three solar radio bursts, yes. right? And she so they, is, you can say she is a discoverer of both Type One and Type Three bursts. Okay, okay, cool. And uh, this, and I remember people sent me that image, going, "Is that Ellie Arroway from Contact?" It's like, no, that's a real person. <laughs> but that, that's what sprung to mind for many people who saw that, because they sent it to me as well for that reason. <laughs> You know, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, yeah, because of the headphones. And yes, it's true, they did actually, I mean, but they were seeing signals from the sun that were super huge, right? Yeah, they were talking right. millions of Janskys, and, and most of what we look at now is, is a, a millionth or less of a Jansky. Yeah, in fact, it's a mega, it's a, a, a billion, one billion Janskys. Oh, one billion Janskys, okay. So yeah, really active sun, really It may be the largest radio signal ever detected on Earth oh, that my she gosh. participated in. Wow. So and what it, kind it, 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 just to, to finish the story, the reason yeah. that she dropped off of everyone's radar, as it was, because yeah. she uh, she got into a lot of trouble because of the regulations uh, influencing the employment of women in Australia, including uh, a married woman's role in the workplace, and of course there was no maternity leave. And at the age of 39, which was a very old age in Australia in 1950. Uh, uh, one, uh, mm -hmm. she gave birth to her uh, first of two children, so she had to quit. So, you see, her radio astronomy career from 1944 to 1951. Uh, 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 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So she laid the groundwork, and then she disappeared. And a few years later, she came back into the workplace, but only as a school teacher. So she never appeared uh, as a radio astronomer again. Okay. So, so it was partly it was so so mainly it was the pregnancy and not having maternity leave that that seemed to drive her um, from that position. But there was also issue with her marriage as well, yeah. right? Yeah. She she couldn't you couldn't be a permanent employee if you were married as a woman. Was that correct? correct. Or, or okay. Yeah. If if you were a woman, and if almost any job in Australia in 1943, 44, and got married, you lost your permanent employment, including school teachers. Oh which seems gosh. just absolutely outrageous, uh, and and of course the women in 1943 thought this was outrageous. Also, I mean they they didn't think this was fair, right. and the difference was they all complained about it among themselves. But Libby, that uh, uh, Ruby then actually stood up publicly and fought against this, and actually mm -hmm. in, was involved in a public campaign with the bureaucrats and this and the uh, government research organization uh, uh, objecting to this rule. Yeah, she wasn't. Um, she wasn't meek and quiet, as I understand it, from from all the people that you've talked to that knew her. She wouldn't just lie down and take it, right? Yes. She was more out. She was much more outspoken. Um, but she was also married for some time and had to hide the marriage. That's right. She got married to uh, Bill Hall, a remarkable man that uh, we know a lot about, uh, in 1943, uh, uh, and uh, he was very proud of. His wife, and, and, and he, in fact, later on, uh, at about the time that uh, Ruby died in uh, the 19, uh, 1981, uh, Bill told uh, Fiona Hall, his daughter, a very famous artist, the daughter of, uh, of Ruby, the second child, said, you never know the hardships that your mom had to go through uh, mm. in the workplace because she was a woman. And, and you being saying this to his daughter, who was uh, had grown up in the 1960s uh, and 70s? You don't know how lucky you have. Is that the, the, many of these discriminatory uh, activities have disappeared now. Yeah, but it it still took some time. I mean, that didn't happen right away. Yes, in fact, it was many years. It was in in the 1960s and 70s only in Australia when women re uh, received equal wages. Mm -hmm. It was actually built into the law that a typical woman would 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 earn two thirds or three quarters of a man of a man's wage, even in professional wow. employment. Wow! <laughs> oh my gosh! Um, but were her colleagues, were her immediate colleagues, um, very accepting of her as a woman, or, or I mean, or was there were there were there frictions as well? I mean, there was some friction, only in the sense that she was so strong-minded <laughs> and she was opinionated. But in fact. We do know that her, her, her male colleagues, who typically were much younger than 
her. They had graduated from university in the early 1940s, okay. and so she was more experienced. The fact that she was very gifted as a mathematician, she was very helpful, and the, some of her men employees or colleagues have told me, in fact, that if they would have a math problem, some complicated differential equation to solve, they would come to Ruby and she would solve it for them. She was very generous. They all respected her. In fact, they all knew that she was married in 1943, and they were part of the this quiet conspiracy that, that uh, in fact, uh, never talked about it. Wow. So, they so in help fact, she did have a lot of admiration, for, I would say, from 90-odd percent of her uh, colleagues, uh, because, not surprising, she had to be the best, she had yeah. to be the most intelligent, and, uh, and she was generous with... Uh, with helping uh, her colleagues. And there were two other women, incidentally, there. That's also very important. And we've, I've now realized, and we've written about this in the book, that these three women who were all physicists bonded together and they helped each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was a little, a little clique of them helping. And sometimes they would be get, get into conflicts with each other, uh, but they realized that this was uh, self-defeating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, all right, it's, it's us against the, the patriarchy guys. <laughs> Yes. Wow. Uh, we have a question from Todd Howard asking where the term Jansky comes from. Oh, good question. It comes from the first radio astronomer, Carl G. Jansky, uh, an American who, uh, of uh, Czech origin who grew up in Wisconsin, graduated from the University of Wisconsin in, I think, of the order of 1930-31 and went to work for Bell Telephone Labs. And there's a long story, and, and, and I won't go into the details. There's a fantastic uh, uh, a Wikipedia article about Carl Jansky that explains what he did at Bell Telephone Labs. And by serendipity, a serendipitous discovery, he discovered the radio waves from the cosmos when he was investigating uh, uh, interference that impacted uh, uh, long-distance uh, radio telephone uh, com communication across the Atlantic. Yeah, so, so that, that term was named, was named after him in, in his honor, yes. so that's energy density coming from um, used in radio observations. Yeah, okay, cool, thank you, Todd. Um, so what was it, did, did they talk about what it was like, okay, so the early, early days of radio astronomy, They've just discovered that there's this cosmic static and, and solar static and solar noise, they're calling it. Did they talk anything about what it was like just having the whole field open to them? No yeah. one actually knowing what they were looking for. And you see, they had a special problem. These folks were physicists and electrical engineers. They didn't know any astronomy. <laughs> fact, it was a couple of years before they were actually met a live astronomer. <laughs> so uh, we've been told that Ruby actually was desperately trying to learn astronomy and she brought oh. she bought this very famous book that went through what was it maybe seven or eight editions by smart called spherical astronomy you might have even seen this book Nicole when you were a graduate student I, and certainly in the 1960s uh, this was a book that we all used and the first edition came out in the 1940s and she was she was desperately trying to learn about uh, astronomical coordinates yeah, yeah. <laughs> essential declination, they'd never heard that term. Oh, wow. She learned it, and she was actually teaching some of her colleagues, and she would loan their, them copies of Smart's book. And fortunately, there was a famous optical radio solar physicist, a man called Clay, Claiborne was his name, Allen, okay. A-L-L-E-N, who became a very famous astronomer at the University College London. And Clay Allen was working at the... Commonwealth Solar Observatory in Canberra, not too far from Sydney, a few hundred miles, and he was very interested in, in this new solar uh, results. In fact, on the big, the giant solar burst of uh, March 1947 that Ruby participated in, this was the Billion Jansky event, Clay Allen had seen a huge sunspot develop. In fact, that mm. sunspot in March 1947 was I believe the second or third largest sunspot in modern history. Wow. About a half a percent of the solar surface was was uh, was covered by this uh, the sunspot, and of course it produced these fantastic type one 
type three and type two bursts that uh, that Ruby discovered and uh, made all these interesting observations. And you can see the fact that they were people understood radar, they understood signal processing, they understood how radio telescopes work, and and they of course were learning solar physics from Clay Allen. He was on the phone with them, he visited them, and was telling them about solar physics. And of course, he was a professional solar. Uh, a radio, uh, a, 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 a professional radio, not excuse me, a professional solar astronomer. Mm -hmm. So they're learning all of this as they go. This is a brand yes. new field. The astronomers don't understand the radio engineering, of course, right? And so they can only they help with part of it. They were even uh, they weren't even sure. They, they the the classical astronomers even had debates among themselves. Were these new uh, folks were they real astronomers? Oh wow. And in fact, the Ruby's boss, a man called uh, Joseph Pauzy, invented the word, word radio astronomy in 1948. He thought we're going to stop calling what we do solar noise mm -hmm. and cosmic noise. We really are astronomers. We're learning astronomy. We're starting to go to astronomy meetings, uh, and and let's have a new term: radio astronomy. <laughs> awesome. And they were publishing too. They were publishing the astronomy journals, and and a lot, and uh, some of Ruby's work was published in Nature as well. Oh yes, all uh, these first couple of papers that had a huge impact on on astronomy were published in Nature and in, uh, in uh, uh, February 1946, mm -hmm. uh, and in April 1947, the big solar burst. And this got the. The professional astronomers throughout the world uh, started paying attention to this, okay. and they started writing letters to these folks in Australia. And were they in support, or were they looking for more data? What were they? Well, they, they, they just, just kind of started to find out more of what's going on. Okay. Uh, and yeah. it was very important that Joe Pauzy at least uh, went on a world tour mm -hmm. for a 13-month period. He and his wife got on a boat. In Australia in uh, September 1947, and came back 13 months later. They went to the U.S. first. They went to Canada, and then they got on a boat and they went on the Queen Elizabeth, the old Queen Elizabeth, uh, from New York to uh, Southampton. And he was in Europe for uh, about six months, and he was meeting all of these folks and giving talks and and learning. And, and it was the ultimate networking experience, and he was sending letters to Ruby all the time, mm -hmm. and Ruby was collecting postcards. Okay. Trip. And she and she was thrilled to get a postcard that had the Tower of London, for instance. Oh wow! Oh wow! So she did get credit for her work, but oh, um, then what happened afterwards? That her name kind of got uh, lost well, in the history. The fact that she left work, mm -hmm. the people remembered her. They talked about her, so when yeah. I started working on this uh, in around 1999, you would, there were a couple of sentences about her in history of science books, history of astronomy books, would say that most people thought that she was probably the first woman radio astronomer. They weren't sure. It mm -hmm. turns out to be correct. Uh, they didn't appreciate uh, all these fundamental discoveries that she had made, like the, the type 1 and the type 3 bursts. That she understood how to do interferometry, which is a technical term expressing how we achieve high angular resolution. Uh, she worked out the mathematics of that process, and uh, so, as you know, I started giving talks, and I've given, of course, mainly many lectures throughout Australia. There's, I, I believe, I've given a lecture in every capital city in Australia except oh, wow. Tasmania. I've been to Hobart, but I've never given a lecture about. <laughs> I've even give, given a talk about her in the Northern Territory. Uh, so, and there've been radio programs. If you Google now, you'll find uh, your work on Ruby, it's, uh, Nicole's <laughs> contributions to uh, the uh, popularization, and then there's the Wikipedia article that I wrote, of course. But there's uh, there's a fantastic website uh, from the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting. Corporation, the Science Show, and uh, mm -hmm. and when people send me emails and they want to find out about Ruby, I suggest that they look at the was it February 2004, I believe. I'm not sure of the year. There's a, a complete transcript of a one-hour program that has a very serious discussion by me and but not, mainly by other people. 
that knew Ruby, including uh, Ruby's uh, daughter. Uh, and so this is a great resource, and it was a way that I got started on un unearthing her story. So how does the how did the family react when you you reached out to them uh, that you were they going were to thrilled. write a story? And it it didn't hurt that both of her children. Of course, uh, she always went by the name Payne Scott, and, she, and it was only after she left work that she took the name Hall. Uh, both of her children are very famous Australians. Uh, okay. Her daughter is the most famous. Her, uh, uh, if there are any of your participants that happen to be Australian or know Australia, they will have heard of Fiona Hall, okay. who is, I would say, is in one of the top ten most famous and recognized artist of Australia with all kinds of amazing artwork. You can look her up on Wikipedia. There's a lot of amazing artwork. In fact, the cover of the new book that you've already shown. Yeah, yeah. This cover, that little piece of artwork there. Oh, that was done by Fiona. Fiona Hall. Oh my gosh. It's all reconstructed art, and it's a and it's a reconstructed picture of the famous uh, view of uh, Mount Fuji. Oh wow. Uh, from the famous Japanese artist. You guys uh, can see that. Hokusai. Uh, and you see, see it's made that. out of doilies. They're banana peels. And they're oh pictures, my gosh! The pictures of girls surfing with 1950 uh, uh, swimming. <laughs> it's I a bit of a joke. I closely at it. That's awesome. But, but that's so, so. Most Australians know Fiona Hall. Her artwork is in, in every capital city of Australia. They have large exhibits. She has outdoor artwork that's close to the Sydney Opera House. There's a, there's a picture in the book about that. So that didn't hurt. Uh, in fact, Fiona has been incredibly supportive of uh, finding out about her mother. Uh, Libby and I had one of the most amazing two-day visits with Fiona in 2007 in Adelaide, where she lived. Mm -hmm. And she talked about her mother nonstop for a couple of days. I was recording uh -huh. it all. Oh, wow. uh, and we have a great conversation that I have on tape where Fiona has been given a, uh, a large collection of lobster isn't it, by some neighbor. So she is hitting the lobster. She's breaking up the lobster with a, with a wooden mallet while I'm recording, and she's telling me all these stories about her oh mother. Oh, gosh. <laughs> did, but, they know that, did they know she was so influential to the science? Uh, no. Uh, oh, wow. Fiona knew that she, of course, had done this, but she didn't know it. Now, her son is even more remarkable in a sense because he's a scientist. He is undoubtedly the most famous Australian mathematician. Mm. He has many, many awards, many international awards. Uh, he was made a member of the Order of Australia last Australia Day, last, uh, wow. 26th of January, uh, 2000. Uh, in 13, he was made a member of the Order of Australia. He's a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, and many, many scientists in Australia, of course, uh, knew, knew Peter, and only in the last few years have they appreciated who Peter's mother was. Wow, wow. Uh, and so he's been a big supporter, but he didn't know many of the details of her science, but he's a, he's a mathematician. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's interesting that they just didn't even know the... <laughs> The scientific treasure they had in their household. Yeah, and they do that. And she would sometimes uh, tell Peter stories because, as a child, he was interested in science and in physics. And she would tell him about the thrill she had when she saw the interference fringes from the rising sun on Australia Day, 1946. And Peter never forgot this. She appreciated, of course, what she was observing and the implications this had for the. Uh, for the whole issue of uh, the mechanism of, of radio emission from the sun. Can you tell us a little bit about that interferometer experiment? Because I didn't realize until reading your book that she was at the forefront of interferometry, which is my favorite thing. <laughs> uh, so this might, is, we, hmm? we might even show a picture. Do you have the picture of the do you of have bookmarked? Sea, sea cliff. Uh, I don't have it bookmarked. No. I'm about to find it. Here it is. This ah. may be good. It's on page 118. Okay. I don't think it's going to show up very well. It's probably going to be a little fuzzy for most people. It's a little fuzzy for your visitors. Yeah, uh, yeah. But you, you can look. It's very simple. You can see you had a 
radar antenna uh -huh. was no longer transmitting. It was only a radar receiver at this point, which it turned into a radio telescope. It's at a sea cliff. It's looking out at the rising sun. Okay, now you can think about how can the rays from the sun get to this radio telescope, this radar receiver. You can have a direct path. It can come straight from the sun. And it can also bounce off the sea. So you see, you have a Here fictitious. We ah, well done. <laughs> Fast Google. <laughs> you did it. You there found go. Google. Okay, you, now you see the direct ray and the path ray. Now Ruby is sitting up in that antenna on the left on the sea cliff. And this is a very high sea cliff. Libby and I have been there many times. It has a height of almost 100 meters. Oh my it's gosh. about 290 feet. And it's an incredible view. I mean, you're looking out over the Pacific Ocean, and you're only 10 miles from the center, from the Sydney Opera House. Oh, wow. Uh, and it simulates a radio telescope that has the path length of twice the cliff height. Okay, okay. So you see, this is a pretty cool interferometer. It's made yeah. of, a, of a one single radio telescope, not two, like we're used to. Nicole and I have spent a lot of our lives as astronomers observing with the VLA and the VLBA, and especially you've been the VLBA aficionado for the last uh, many years of your career, uh, observing also at Green Bank. Yeah, yeah, and then I helped build paper. <laughs> yes, that's another you interferometer. Don't, you don't understand an interferometer until you built one. <laughs> it's yes, what I and those interferometers, the ones that you and I work with in the modern era, are called Michelson interferometers. Mm -hmm. The Sea Cliff interferometer, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, quite a few of your uh, participants have, have studied physics and they know about a Lloyd's mirror, mm -hmm. la named after the famous Irish physicist, Mr. Lloyd. And that's what this is. This is the radio equivalent of an optical Lloyd's mirror. Uh, and you see they had it in place, but it's a kind of an, it, you have to say, it's an inflexible interferometer. You have one baseline. Yeah. But and in you fact, can only see the sun for a short period of time. Yeah, for about an hour a day, and yeah. only at solar rising. So later on, some, some of, Ruby didn't go, but some of her colleagues went over to New Zealand where the cliffs were almost 300 meters. Oh, wow. uh, three times higher, and you had both an east-facing and a west-facing slope by going to the east coast and the west coast at a distance of only about a hundred some odd kilometers. Uh, and they so saw the sun rising and the sun setting, and they were also observing the sources that they call the radio stars, which were the first radio sources. Right. So yeah, so they use that to, to get increase your, their angular resolution, or, or, or to get better angular resolution, because the radars themselves had Resolution of what? Tens of degrees. Ten degrees. But yeah. The, so like your hand at arm's or your fist at arm's length is is the you know the, the kind of accuracy they had on the sky. But for the low frequency radars that the Australians had during World War II, they also were seeing uh, Lloyd's mirror fringes from incoming aircraft. Oh, okay. right. That that was that why they was that why it was developed. Uh, no, they they okay. thought it, they were physicists. Uh, they uh, they built it because the sea. Coast was where the Japanese invasion was going to occur yeah, from, of course. Yeah. They, were, oh, they were getting okay. ready for the uh, Japanese air attacks. In fact, in northern Australia, as uh, as many people know, uh, many uh, cities like Townsville, Queensland, Darwin, of course, uh, were attacked by the uh, J uh, J Japanese naval aircraft from air, uh, aircraft carriers in February, March uh, 1942. So the expectation was that the Japanese would attack uh, Sydney and Melbourne, et cetera. It would never happen, mm -hmm. but they were getting prepared for that. Sure. And they turned on their radars at the seacoast. They saw these fringes, and they were physicists, and they realized what they were. So you see, the C the sea cliff interferometer principle was already known, but using it as a radio telescope was not known. And Ruby was, in fact, the first person that wrote down the equations uh, that okay. described the response that you showed. Uh, uh, just a few minutes ago from that interferometer, you can write down the relationships of the size and the location of the source to the response of the uh, of the radar receiver. So, so what did this interferometer help them to see better? Well, they, they could tell that the 
instead of having a 10 degree picture of the sun, mm -hmm. they had an image of the sun with a resolution of about 20 or 30 arc minutes, the size of uh -huh. the moon. You see, it's about a factor of. Uh, so that's of like half, of, just like your pinky finger, even smaller than your pinky finger at uh, arm's length. And you see, the first up. thing that Ruby noticed, she knew then the fact that she was getting fringes from these type one burst on Australia Day, the 26th of January, 1946, that the radio mission was much smaller than the total size of the sun. Okay. It was well, about the size. It was it was somewhat bigger than the uh, sunspot, but it was uh, say about a tenth of the size of the uh, of the sun, and hence, to use the jargon that you and I would be uh, would would be familiar with, it had a huge brightness temperature. The brightness temperature was over a was uh, like a hundred or a thousand billion degrees Kelvin. Right, so it's not it's nothing like the actual temperature of the sun. It's not right. a thermal source of emission. So they were trying That's to figure out what the heck this was. And and the radio astronomers were also discovering something else at that time, or it was remarkable about the sun. If you observed at high frequencies, like the frequencies at which, uh, say, your communication with your satellite TV works at the sun, you would see the six thousand Kelvin brightness of the solar photosphere. Mm -hmm as the optical astronomers, but the radio astronomers observing at these frequencies uh, detected this huge solar corona that is often observed in eclipses, of course. Yeah. It's many times larger than the, than the size of the sun that we observe, uh, uh, not with your eye, of course you should never look at the sun with your eye, but with a <laughs> special you. solar telescope. <laughs> it's many degrees in size, and the size of the solar corona and the radio is a couple of degrees in size, and it has a brightness temperature of one million degrees. Okay. Okay. Yeah, which is what we we understand that to be. Yeah. We understand that to be, and you see the great thing that about radio astronomy, you could solar, study the solar corona any day. You didn't have to wait for an eclipse. Right. Right. Yeah. Whereas otherwise, you had to wait for an eclipse and be in the right place and have yeah. the right weather to just study it in optical. So they uh, were able not to. Not the radio telescope. You can observe it. With a radio telescope through rain. See, guys, I say this all the time. <laughs> this is why radio astronomy is the best. <laughs> we don't need no clouds. We don't need the nighttime. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, what was it like doing historical research, and how is that different from from the the science you, research you, you've been doing all your life? Well, this was painful. <laughs> very, very, very. Uh, but fortunately. My, our son is a historian of science. Oh, okay. That was a big help. Although I have to say he's a very severe critic, but that's very good. <laughs> uh, and uh, in fact, his wife, my daughter-in-law, is the editor of this book. It's okay. Read when you read the preface. Uh, so that was helpful to have a historian of science in the family. But I met a couple of historians of science, and I started learning how to use archives. Okay. So. So what did I do? I went around and interviewed many scores of people, maybe a hundred in the end, wow. people that knew Ruby. But of course, you realize when you're talking to them about events that had heard that had occurred 40 and 50 years previously, that very often the reliability of the details is uh, not surprisingly uh, can be questionable. So you realize when you when you hear something in an interview from that occurred long ago. You take it as an indication, but you're not sure you can use it. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the great aspect of what Ruby did and her colleagues is that they work for a government organization. It's like the, the National Science Organization of Australia called the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. And it is a, an incredible bureaucracy, and everything was put on a piece of paper. That helps. <laughs> including why do you find them? Including hostile notes that were written to Ruby by the personnel folks when they discovered that she was married. A little oh small piece of paper that would would be like you were writing a piece of on a, a yellow sticky. There were no yellow stickies then, of course. And this was a, a, a sarcastic note about the fact that she was disobeying regulations, and oh that was put in her personnel file. And we have that. Oh my gosh. And so, all of the details of her personnel record we have. Uh, 
I'll tell you something in the moment about our ASIO file if you have time. Mm -hmm. We may not have time for that. That's in the book. That's her security uh, uh, record and, and the equivalent of the uh, of the FBI, uh, CIA of Australia called ASIO, the Australian Security and Intelligence Organization. We have her file there. There's something, on, if you Google Ruby, you'll find people in the National Archives of Australia actually have put up her ASIO file, and about one-third of it is redacted. That is, wow. it's completely blacked out. But all the rest of her career, including copies of handwritten letters, etc., were kept in the records. They ended up in the National Archives in Sydney and in Canberra, and I went there, and I have photographed, and, there, and I showed you earlier today that my incredible full office is full of notebooks, about 300 of them, uh, that includes all the paperwork that I have had copied in Australia or that I have photographed when I go to the Australian Archives, and that's how you reconstruct her, her uh, professional story. You put together and you make a, a timeline of her life, uh, you develop themes. You figure out what she did. Uh, they went. They had meetings at work uh, once a week, once every two weeks, about discussing the science. And there were detailed minutes kept. And I have uh, two or three huge notebooks, and we can see what Ruby was saying to her colleagues um, some day in March uh, 1949. Wow! Wow! That's impressive. I don't think any of us keep meeting minutes that well anymore. <laughs> Well, mm -hmm. you, you can see with email. My, my prediction is, and I would, I, I'm, I'm sure there's some of your participants have theories about this too. I'd be interested in what they think. Yes, you know, ask yourself the question: Fifty years from today, yeah, would it be possible to reconstruct one of our scientific colleagues' life in a detailed way, like, like we did from 1945 to 1955? Mm -hmm. Because there's email, uh, Twitter. Uh, you can see we don't write things down. We don't have a permanent right. record, and it's hard to imagine 50 years from now that people are going to be interested in reading yours and my emails from today. Yeah, so it's, it's a deluge of, of information now. It, it might be too yeah. much to get yeah. a clear picture. Right. And uh, the other thing I have to say that, that piercing together then a lot of the personal details of Ruby's life and her life with her husband and her life as a active bushwalker, mm -hmm. it's an Australian expression. You know, she was a passionate bushwalker and did this a lot. And there were, I, we met a number of people that were still alive that told us about going on hikes with them, uh, and the fact that she was incredibly strong as an individual. In the book, there are pictures of her standing on some of the peaks uh, in uh, Tasmania. At Christmas trips, of course, in Christmas trips in Australia, you would go because it's the middle of summer. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the aspect that the fact that uh, Asia be became interested because they thought that she was left wing and they thought that she was a member of the Communist Party of Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, amazingly enough, they could never figure it out. And and if, uh, and with the help of her son, I found a, a handful of folks in. Uh, an, 1999 and 2000 that knew her as a member of the Communist Party of Australia. Wow, wow. So that did that get her much in trouble with her colleagues? It would or was have. That it's, not a big deal. The, the, it was never illegal to member to be a member of the Communist Party of Australia, oh, okay. but of course it was heavily frowned upon, and uh, there were many informers inside of the CPA, the Communist Party of Australia, that were telling ASIO what was going on. Wow. Oh. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you know this is a pernicious type of, of of reporting because you can say anything, and the things were said about Ruby that are in her ASIO file that were just uh, not incorrect. But they never knew that she was a member of the party. In fact, oh. she was. Uh, we now know that, and we're also certain that she broke with the Communist Party of Australia in the 1950s, perhaps at one of the times when many members of Communist parties in Western countries were breaking. With the Communist Party, at say at the time of uh, of the uh, of the exposure of Stalin's crimes by Khrushchev, the so-called okay. secret speech, it's a very famous event, and also the, at the invasion of, of of Budapest and Hungary in 1958. Okay. So by the sometime in the 1950s, she was no longer a member of the Communist Party. 
Okay, so she was probably disillusioned with it, yeah. I think she was disillusioned. Wow, wow. So, so she had several. So there were several reasons why they could have uh, had trouble with her. She was a woman. She was married. Couldn't do that at the time. Um, she was a member of the Communist Party. Like you said, that would have been a problem. With her, uh, she was also an advocate, a really strong advocate for peacetime research. I think as well. That's right. She was. She got at the end of the war. The question was, should the CSRO continue on wartime related research? During the war, of course, they had heavy security there. Mm -hmm. They had to, right? I mean, the security of vis-a-vis uh, -vis German and possible Japanese espionage was very serious. Uh, and uh, the survival of Australia uh, depended on, on this. So the question was, should they go back to peacetime research? Uh, CSRO was well known right. for agricultural research, of course, working on uh, uh, cotton, uh, uh, sheep, research, et cetera, and would they, would they change radar classified research into something that was non-classified like a, a directional finding, uh, air navigation, working on computers, and radio astronomy. And she, and she wrote articles supporting uh, going into non-classified research, the fact that they can have communication with their colleagues internationally, and ASIO saw this and they didn't like the fact that she was uh, suggesting that CSRO should should uh, should not be uh, doing classified research wow. anymore. Wow! Wow! But they they did the classified parts of the CSRO that did continue, like in uh, aeronautical research. Uh, they left mm -hmm. and went into a, a separate part of the government, and so CSRO did. They won the the battle that day. Right, and CSRO is still around today doing scientific research. Yes, they are still the leaders of radio astronomy in the world, one of the major leaders. Yeah. They're the people who are building the SKA prototype in Western Australia. Uh, I, I spend a, a lot of time, of course, when I'm in Australia, not only in archives, but working with radio astronomy colleagues at Sydney University, at the CSRO, uh, Australia Telescope Compact Array, uh, also in Perth, mm -hmm. where there are many radio astronomers now working on the SKA. Uh, and uh, and of course, there, there's lots of recognition of Ruby's achievements now among the astronomical community in Australia. That's awesome. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, so I am going to, I want to wrap up with a few announcements, but um, afterwards I'd like to give you um, a moment to, to let us, to tell us about your, um, your favorite part about researching Ruby. But uh, first I want to plug the book again. So this is Making Waves, the story of Ruby Payne Scott, Australian pioneer radio astronomer. It's available on Amazon. Uh, Guido Vibra has put the link to the, the Amazon link uh, in the comments for the Google event. Uh, I'll be adding that to the YouTube description after the event posts as well. Um, so I got my copy. I'm very happy. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Miller, for giving me the sneak preview as well <laughs> so I could read it while I was away. Um, so check out the book. Uh, it's a really fascinating story. I, I love this story, and I'm glad I at least got to see some of it as it's been coming out over the last nine years <laughs> since I was a summer student at NRAO. Um, so uh, just to let you guys know, uh, we're actually the My Moon uh, folks, Andy Shaner's doing a hangout starting right after this one at 7 p.m. Central. Um, so that's uh, eight, uh, I can't do math right now in my head, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, so in just about 10 minutes there'll be a My Moon hangout. I'll be sharing that link as well. We'll be talking about um, what the My Moon Street team does and getting people to talk about lunar science and all in all kinds of weird places. Uh, the Weekly Space Hangout is on Friday, so same time, same place, noon Pacific. We'll be talk. Uh, I'll be back, and, and Fraser will be Fraser Kane will be hosting, and we'll be talking about all the news this week uh, in space in uh, in astronomy. And then Sunday night is the virtual star party. Monday is astronomy cast, as long as Pamela's travels line up with the the correct time. And uh, we'll be back again next week for this, for Learning Space. I'll have Georgia Bracey back, and we'll be talking about more astronomy education um, from the last uh, conference we were at. So stay tuned for that. Uh, I think that's all the announcements I wanted to make. Um, oh, one more thing. I am teaching a short online course about radio astronomy uh, starting in September. So if you go to cosmoquest.org, and then up at the top uh, at the Educate button and CosmoQuest classes, I think it's being called CQX011. 
uh, you can sign up for that course. It'll be a short course. It'll just be four lectures over the course of two weeks. We'll be using the Google Hangouts to do discussions and to uh, you can learn some of what some, some more about the terms and, and the basics of radio astronomy that we've been talking about here today. Uh, so I'll put the link to that in the in the show notes as well. Um, so those are all the announcements I wanted to make. And and Miller, do you have any parting thoughts? Something really that stood out um, to you about about Ruby while you're researching her life? I think the main impression was that she was a passionate person who enjoyed what she was doing. Uh, she, she liked electronics. She, mm -hmm. Radio astronomers in those days, they had to do everything. They had to build the radio telescope. They had to do the observations. They didn't have computers, right? The re results came out on pieces of paper. Uh, oh, yeah, I, even for, I forgot about that. That is like, the coolest thing. <laughs> and then they had to use rulers and slide rules. Oh. They did have a couple of hand calculators, these mechanical calculators, and they were doing things like Fourier transforms by hand. And, and you and I have done a lot of Fourier transforms, but never by hand. No. <laughs> and, and, you, and you think about, you know, and then they had to think about the physics and what was going on on the sun. They, were, they didn't understand anything about synchrotron emission. Mm -hmm. They were learning plasma emission. Uh, it's hard to imagine to enter a field literally from the ground floor where everything you do is new and the next step forward you've got to invent the way to get there. That's an experience I don't think any of us will ever have. No, no, that is amazing and, and I'm glad we got to, uh, you're bringing us her story of how she was, uh, how she was a pioneer in that so that's really great. Oh, so thank you so much. Um, did want to point out uh, one comment from Guido Vibra. Uh, Utterly amazing. This hangout is full of history. I can't even think of a coherent question right now. I'm too fascinated. So <laughs> thanks for, for commenting, Guido. Uh, good to see you guys again. I'm waving at you guys in the chat. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's good to be back and good to be live again. Um, so thank you, Miller, so much for, for joining me to talk about this. Um, like I said, everybody, check out the book, uh, Making Waves all about Ruby Payne Scott. Uh, and I think that's it for this week's Learning Space. So thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>